Good morning. Good morning. That was good. We waited a year and a half almost to be able to say that to each other and in person. So good morning. Good morning. <laughs> and thank you for your good response both times. I'm Chalmer McClure, and I welcome you to the First Congregational Church of Redlands. For those of you who are here, it's nice to see your smiling faces. For those who are watching online live, it's good that you're here. For those who will watch in the future on YouTube, we are welcoming you too. So now that we are back, there are some um, things that we need to remind each other of. And I had forgotten this for the first couple of weeks. Turn down your phones. Silence your phones. I, get, I seem to get spam and voicemails in the middle of church, so remember to turn those down. Second is that on the back of your bulletins, we have our safety protocols that are in place, and uh, we encourage you to read those, and for those who are fully vaccinated, certainly you are welcome not to wear a mask. For those who are not fully masked or vaccinated, thank you for wearing your masks. And uh, the board of directors is continually updating protocols so things change over time and we will let you know what is acceptable and not acceptable. Now, um, one of the advantages or perhaps disadvantages of being up here and greeting is I get to tell you some things that you might not otherwise have heard or wanted to hear. And so, um, in relationship to our guidelines and masks and so on, um, I, I'm a physician, as most of you know. I'm a specialist in child neurology. And I came into Southern California, let's see, 1982, and did graduate work, went to medical school, did an internship, did a residency, then left for three years for a fellowship in child neurology. Now that is not to say, look at how wonderful I am, it is to show you that in 40 years, I've learned a couple of things. And um, one, if I were smart, I wouldn't have spent 28 years in school and paid thousands of dollars um, and postponed any earning. But I want to talk to you as a physician. And the things that I've learned is most patients don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told what to do when I go to see my doctor but I do listen. Second, most people don't do what the doctor tells them to do anyway, even though they sit and nod in the session. What I have found is that people listen to stories and that they can relate to if there is some type of personal aspect to you. So forgive me for the next five minutes, I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about my grandfather, my father, and me. <laughs> yeah, here we go again. <laughs> um, a century ago, during the Spanish flu, my grandfather and his brother, my great uncle, were young men um, gotten out of the army and they were working as mechanics in a tiny farm town on the eastern side of Colorado. When the pandemic hit, it affected friends and family. They were one of the few people that had vehicles ready, readily available to them because they were mechanics and they could fix the cars when they broke down. So they spent a year and a half shuttling the little town doctor around to farms, to the houses, to their friends' homes when the Spanish flu hit. And I didn't know anything about that, obviously, until they were telling me in the 1960s of how helpless they felt because they couldn't do anything. 20 years later, my father was studying in high school and wanted to be an engineer. Same little farm town. World War II intervened, and he joined the Army uh, Air Corps, now the Air Force. And he wanted to be a pilot. But when he was going through pilot training, he was found to have an astigmatism. And that astigmatism kept him from being a pilot. 
So the army in its wisdom moved him over to being in uh, aviation medicine. And that's where he learned about taking care of airmen and mechanics and so on from illnesses not only due to war, but just life in the military where pandemics happen. Typhoid, all sorts of things like cholera are endemic to armies. And it kills more people than it does, than are lost to war and actual combat deaths. Just so you are aware, we have now surpassed in the United States the number of deaths of people from the pandemic than were killed from five years of combat deaths in World War II for the United States. We've lost a lot of people. My father went to undergraduate and medical school, and in medical school he learned about preventive medicine and thought, what better thing to do than prevent people from getting ill than having to treat them afterwards? What a novel concept. So he entered the US Public Health Service, and they sent him to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to the University of Penn, uh, Pittsburgh to become a doctor of public health in addition to his MD. He worked for the public health department for 25 years, working primarily with black lung and tuberculosis. And these were preventable diseases. And he also worked with Jonas Salk. Anybody remember his name? He was at the University of Pittsburgh, and his group, which included dozens if not hundreds of people who were working on the polio vaccine, developed that vaccine. I don't, anybody here remember polio? Anybody have polio? Anybody have family that had polio? Hundreds of kids and wards that were in iron lungs because they were paralyzed. Their diaphragm was paralyzed. I took care of, I think, one of the last surviving persons in the iron lung who had para, uh, polio as a child back in the late 90s. But my father brought home the vaccine as soon as it was available and vaccinated my siblings. I was not born yet, but he vaccinated them. And I've, in the family reunions, we talk about Thank you that he had enough wisdom and access to be able to do that to prevent children from having polio. Because this is the time of year when polio came out. It was during the summertime and it affected the young people more than anybody else. So I've had opportunity to take care of both children's and adults who have had significant virus related illnesses that have affected the nervous system. We don't think of measles as being a problem anymore. But because it is still present, we do still have children who are affected by it. I have personally taken care of five children who were exposed to measles when they were before two years of age. They recovered from the measles, but the measles stayed in the neurons. And 10 years later, they deteriorated. First, it started at school. They're not paying attention. Their grades are going down. Then they start having jerks. Then they aren't able to talk, can't interact with their family. And this is called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. Remember that because there's a quiz later <laughs> called SSPE. And we were helpless to do anything other than to watch them die, despite heroic efforts. And it could have been prevented. So what am I saying? You don't, you don't have to listen to what I say. You don't have to like what I say. But we do need to be aware of this going on in our country, in our st uh, state, in our county in our city 
and we have the vaccine readily available. If you have, I'm probably pe preaching to the choir, but if you haven't been vaccinated, I know I'm not going to convince you to be vaccinated if you don't want to be. Um, but for those of you who are sitting on the fence and wondering, should I be vaccinated? Yes. You need to do that not only for yourself, but for your family and your children. Our children are not able to be vaccinated yet. Uh, up to age 12, they are not able to be vaccinated. Over that, they are being vaccinated, but the current variant is a type that affects young people. Most of us have gotten vaccinated, so the old people who have gotten it and who have recovered or succumbed, they're at, we're out of the picture, but the children are not vaccinated and they can still get it. And at the hospital, we have a number of children who have something called multi-system inflammatory, multi-system multi inflammatory uh, syndrome. And it can affect adults too, but it affects the brain, it affects the heart, it affects the gut, it affects the lungs, it affects the kidneys. And these kids can survive, but they have significant problems ahead. Now, let's do it for the children, if nothing else. So, I just gave you a $150 consult when you don't have to pay for anything. I will be standing in the back and collect if you would like. <laughs> so, having said all of that, thank you for being here. We look forward to your participation in this service. And we will begin with our first hymn, if you will stand with me, 498, Peace Like a River. As we say our words of witness, they are listed in your bulletin if you do not recall them, and they are on the screens as well. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, goodness, and love, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, who for us and our salvation lived and died and rose again and lives evermore and in the Holy Spirit, who takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us, renewing, comforting, and inspiring our souls. We are united in striving to know the will of God as taught in the Holy Scriptures, and in our purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord, made known or to be made known to us. Amen.
as you were seating, turn, wave, smile, blow kisses to those around you, and then you may be seated. So um, we have a few announcements, and those of you who have the announcements, make your way toward the podium. Summertime is a time to be with family, and it is no different for our interim pastor, John McDonald. He is with his family this week, and Rachel Bergman, who has spoken to us several weeks ago, will be substituting for him, and we look forward to her message. Um, there are, in the life of the church, we do have several Bible studies going on in person and also through Zoom. Uh, for that information, you can see in our bulletin, also in the weekly tidings, and through our church office, so you can get that information if you so wish to participate. So Joe is going to be coming and sharing with us about the work of the um, church. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Chalmer. Uh, amazing story. Uh, we have to have you back. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> uh, see if this will stay up here. I think it will. Uh, last week, the church mailed everyone in the congregation a copy of this position profile describing what we are looking for in a new minister along with a cover letter. Now, if you didn't get one, please contact the church office and have one sent to you. We want to make sure everyone gets it. Maybe our mailing list needs some updating. Help us make sure it's correct. As the cover letter asks, if you know of any minister that might be considered, please send that person's contact information to our person at Stanton Chase at the email and phone number listed in this cover letter. As I mentioned before, we have had some meetings where we were speaking frankly to each other about deeply held views. Views on a petition signed by four members of the search committee to call a church meeting to add an interpretation of a certain Bible passage to our Constitution. I didn't know this, but did you know that our Constitution contains our statement of faith? And it's included, it's included in this position profile. We put it right in there. It states in part, we will depend, it says, as our fathers did, and I will add, as our mothers did, upon the continued guidance of the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. It's another good reason for reading the position profile. We also discussed views on gay marriage membership of gay individuals, the role of women in leadership, divorced individuals in leadership positions, and how we show love to each other. Uh, did you know, I didn't, that the word love is mentioned 550 times in the Bible and is the most frequent phrase and commandment given to us. In short, God tells us more than anything else to love one another, to rejoice, to praise the Lord, and give thanks. Because of these discussions and the petition, the church council decided to conduct a survey of the entire congregation on these and other issues. In their meeting last Tuesday night, they unanimously passed a motion to ask the search committee to draft a survey for their review and approval. Now, some ask, 
why the search committee? <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is that we in the search committee have been wrestling with these issues. We understand the different points of view, and we have a diverse group that represents the different points of view. Our 15 members include eight from the Board of Deacons, two from the Board of Directors, Dave Streit and myself, the moderator, vice moderator, and three, I'll say, respected members of the congregation. Not only will the church council be able to use this data to clearly understand the values of the congregation, but the results will help the search committee as we interview potential candidates that fit this uh, position profile. Now we've got a timeline for doing this, for putting down these questions and getting it back to the church council. I don't know if we'll be able to meet that or not. I can tell you that I personally feel it's much more important that we include everybody, that we do a thorough job, and we take our time and do it right. And if we meet that timeline, great. If that timeline has to slip a little bit, that's okay. And in closing, I'd like to read the last line of this cover letter. It says, please continue to pray for the committee during this search process and your continued purposeful prayers for our church. Thank you very much. Well, we only have 12 days left on our missions committee school supplies for backpacks. So if you haven't provided any school supplies yet, you have 12 days. Now, if you aren't able to get out and buy school supplies, we will take your checks or money. All you have to do is drop it off at the office and we'll buy those school supplies. We have most of the backpacks purchased, but we just need the school supplies to put in them. And we're going to do that on July 31st. So you have about 12 days left to get any school supplies together and, um, or a check, and please take that to the office. Please help us make this program for kids that need backpacks a success. Thank you. Thank you all for the announcements. Uh, one other one is we still need Sunday school uh, teachers. If you feel so inclined, please contact Molly Burgess or, again, the office for information on how to be able to do that. Um, we are now going to be singing hymn number 29. Please remain seated. Glorify thy name.
This would typically be the time that we take our offering uh, and pass the plate, but we are still not doing that. You can contribute if you have your offering and tithe here by putting it in the back box where we put our welcome information or welcome and identification information. You can also go online to redlands.church and donate there should you wish or drop off a check at the church. So let's take this time to bow our heads and enter into conversation with our God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have created. Thank you for your caring love and generosity to us. Thank you for knowing our past, our present, and our future, and still loving us anyway. Thank you that you sent your son to live, die, and resurrect it again so that we know that by trusting on him, we can have communion and a relationship with you. Thank you for those that you have given us in this church. We know we are a diverse group, sometimes foolish children. Sometimes we actually listen to what you have to say. Lord, may we be receptive to your Holy Spirit's promptings and do that which is pleasing in your sight. Lord, we remember those of our community who are ill, who are discouraged, who are in need. Lord, may we be gracious and kind to them and allow you to work through us to provide for their needs. Lord, we pray in situations such as this where we don't know exactly where to go, how to, how to follow the directions that you are giving us. But we know that just as rain falls on the just and the unjust, that you provide for us in times of need. So Lord, we come before you now and bring these prayers to your ear. And we also pray the prayer that you taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for your lovely music. Please stand. up Patty. Patty is going to be reading from Esther. That's a favorite name of my family because my grand, three and a half year old granddaughter is named Esther. And Sue relates a story of telling my granddaughter, you know you're named after a queen? And she was like, so excited and she said, from Frozen? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you're a queen in the Bible. <laughs> Even better than Frozen. <laughs> Good morning. Today's reading is Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Some time later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamaditha the Agagite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by. For so the king had commanded, but Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's command? They spoke to him day after day, but he still refused to comply with the order. So they spoke to Haman about this to see if he would tolerate M Mordecai's conduct, since Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he, had so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So in the month of April, during the 12th year of King Xerxes' reign, Lots were cast in Haman's presence, the lots were called Purim, to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, there is a certain race of people scattered throughout all of the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed, and I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. The king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, some son of Hamaditha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. So on April 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned and the decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. It was sent to the king's highest officers, the governors of the respected respective provinces and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and languages. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Dispatches were sent by swift messengers into all of the provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed slaughtered and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. 
A copy of this decree was to be issued by law in every province and proclaimed to all peoples so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. At the king's command, the decree went out by swift messengers, and it was also proclaimed in the fortress of Susa. Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa fell into confusion. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it is my honor and privilege again to set you up with Rachel Bergman, who is going to be our preacher this morning. Uh, she was here a month ago and talked about Jonah, and today she's going to talk about Haman and unpack the story of Esther for us. So in case you forgot, uh, Rachel is a Wheaton grad. She got her Master's of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary and is in the middle of a PhD program at Hebrew Union College. So she is an expert in, in, or becoming an expert, I should say, in ancient Near East uh, studies, uh, and she's going to talk to us from the Book of Esther. So please give a warm First Congregational welcome to Rachel Bergman. Thank you. It's good to be here again. Um, so that was a bit of a dark passage for reading. Um, spoiler alert, the plan doesn't work. Uh, the, the Jews do not get killed. Everything works out. Um, in fact, just in case it's been a little while since some of you have read the book of Esther, um, I'm going to give you a little recap. So basically what happens be right before this passage is the king has a, has a banquet. It's a it's a pretty epic banquet because it lasts for about six months, is what they say. He, has, he invites all these people over. He wants his wife to come out and appear before all the people because he wants to show off how beautiful his wife is. She refuses, and he gets really mad. And so he, um, he decides to find another queen, and he, the queen that he chooses is Esther. Uh, and she, she happens to be a Jewish woman living in his, his uh, kingdom. He doesn't, know, he doesn't know this about her, though. Um, or he, at least he doesn't know. It, it's, it's not clear if he doesn't know if she's Jewish or if he doesn't know that the group of people that Haman wants to kill are the Jews, because he doesn't actually specify that. So um, anyway, after this, uh, uh, Esther invites, uh, Mordecai finds out about this plan. Mordecai is Esther's. Um, cousin who's, who's kind of um, served as, as her father. He's, he's brought her up. Um, he finds out about this. He tells Esther, you better help us out. She's worried about this, and so she says, you know, I, could, um, I can go into the king and ask, uh, but he hasn't summoned me, so he could kill me if I do this. And he says, well, um, Mordecai says, don't think that you're going to survive just because you're, you're in a position of power right now. But even if you if you don't help us out at this point, help will come for the, help will come for the Jews from another place. But who knows? Maybe you were put in this position just for such a time as this, so you could help us. Uh, so she comes. She asks uh, the king to have a banquet with just her and uh, and Haman and the king. They have the first banquet. She doesn't tell him what's up. Haman goes home thinking he's very favored, but then he sees Mordecai again at the gate and is just, uh, in, in millennial terms, he just can't even. Uh, he's, he's so upset about this. It just ruins his entire day, and so he, he, he kind of whines about this to his family, and they say, uh, well, why don't you build a gallows that you can and ask the king to hang Mordecai, go to him tomorrow, and you can hang Mordecai on the gallows. Haman's like, that's a great idea. And so he does this, and then he goes into the king. The king can't sleep, uh, and so asks for the royal records to be read to him. Oh, key detail I forgot earlier. Uh, right before the, the passage where Haman decides he wants to kill all the Jews, Mordecai has un unveils a... Um, he overhears a plot to, to kill the king, an assassination attempt, tells Esther about it. She tells the king who, who gives Morde and gives Mordecai credit for it, but then nothing's ever done about it. And so the king, as he can't sleep this night, is, is hearing all the royal records and, um, and discovers and 
reads about Mordecai who saved his life and says, oh, what did we do for this guy? And the, the people reading him the, the record are like, well, uh, actually, we didn't do anything. And the king's like, what? How terrible. What an oversight. And so just then, um, it, this book, if you, if you read it, is full of these really wonderful serendipitous moments where people, everything happens at just the right time that, um, and they're, they're, it's full of dramatic irony where the, where the audience knows something that the characters don't. And so Haman walks in and, and the king says, Haman, what should I do for the person that I want to honor? And Haman thinks, well, who's he want to honor besides me? And so he, he has this elaborate ritual where that he puts the kings, he says, you should put your robe on this guy and you should let him ride your horse and run through this and have one of your officials lead him through the city and say, this is what the king does to the person he wants to honor. And the king's like, great idea, go get Mordecai and, and you can lead him through the city on the horse. And obviously Haman is really unhappy about this, having come in just to suggest, how about we kill Mordecai? And in, instead has to do this. So it's, it's very humorous. Um, then we have the second banquet. Uh, Esther invites Haman and the king again. She, um, she reveals that she is Jewish and that Haman is trying to kill all of her people. The king is furious. Haman doesn't know this about her. And so, um, and he's terrified because he knows he's in big trouble now. And so as it, as it happens, Haman gets hanged on the gallows and then the story gets, <laughs> takes a, a turn for the violent because um, they decide in order, the king can't take back his royal decree, so he decides that in order to save the situation, they're going to let the Jews defend themselves. And then we get a, a litany of, uh, of all, the, all the people who get killed during this day when the Jews are allowed to defend themselves. And, um, and then, they, then they say, why don't we do that for another day? So it's a little, it's a little bit of a weird ending to the book, but, um, but there you go, that's the book of Esther. Um, and so as we're, as we're going through this series um, on, on the bad ones in scripture, on people who have a, a villainous or a tragic story, um, Haman really is one of the worst. Uh, I mean, literally, he takes a personal grudge and turns it into genocide kind of kind of bad, you know? I, I think that's, <laughs> it's hard to get worse than that. Um, I'm gonna, as we talk about him, I think I'm gonna talk about two things, and this, this might be a mistake, because it's going in kind of two different directions, but I, I see two things that are, um, that are important that Haman can tell us about ourselves and, and, and about God. One of them, I think, that's important to notice is what is it that Haman exposes in us when we look at him? What is, what is the darkness that he reveals to us that, that is possible in the human heart? But the other thing, and I think in some ways maybe the more threatening thing, is what does Haman threaten to expose to us about God? I'll get there in a minute, but let's, let's go to the, I think, the easier one first, which is um, what does... What does Haman reveal about us? Uh, in some ways, like I said, it's it's hard to relate to him because really, if if ever there were a mustache twirling villain in scripture, it's Haman. He's just he's that kind of guy. He's just the the guy you love to hate, basically. Um, and it, it helps that he doesn't succeed. I think he would be. I think in some ways he'd he'd be a darker character um, if if his plan went the way he wants it to. Uh, but at the same time, I'm, I'm reminded that Jesus says to us, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I say to you, if you're angry with your brother or sister, you will be subject to judgment. So it's worth considering, even if hopefully none of us have a personal grudge that we want to turn into annihilating an entire group of people, I really hope none of us want to do that, probably none of us have the power to do that either, but I think we can still recognize the, the shadows of, of hatred in our own hearts and, and what it does to us. And a couple of things that I think we see hatred doing to Haman. One of them is that it totally saps all of his joy. He, I mean, he is the second most powerful person in the kingdom. And he gets, as he thinks at the time, invited to this banquet exclusively. He's, he's happy about it. And then he sees Mordecai this person that he hates, and, 
and he loses, he just loses it. He can't, he can't be happy about anything. It's not enough for him to be honored, even by the king, even by most of the people he knows. There is this one person who doesn't bow down to him, and he can't stand for that one person to exist. He, in some ways, he's a, he's a deeply insecure person, because a person who is confident, who is, um, who, who likes themselves, who believes in their, in their own value, I don't think would be that affected by someone refusing to bow down to them. It's, it's an insecure person that requires that. And he is so insecure that he can't, he can't even stand to look at this person. It's interesting what his, his rationalization as well, because in the, in the passage that we just saw, um, his rationale to the king is, okay, well, there are these people and they have different laws, uh, so they're, they're kind of weird. And, uh, you know, it, it, in some ways, it makes me think of, of the way we look at sometimes other groups, other religions who have, who have different ways of doing things. They can be kind of scary. They can feel threatening. But anyway, um, he says they're, they're different. It's, it's not good. You shouldn't tolerate them. And, uh, and the, king, uh, the king agrees with him. I mean, as an aside, the king in this whole story is just an idiot. Like, he basically just does whatever the last person told him to do. Um, and somehow he never gets held accountable for that, which is kind of interesting. But that's just kind of the role he plays in this story. Um, the, the world kind of, ironically, for the man who's supposedly holding all the power, all the events kind of revolve around him. Um, anyway. Hey man, this is the this is the reasoning he gives, and yet we've just heard that this has nothing to do with why he wants to kill all the Jews. Uh, literally, he's just taken a personal grudge and expanded it to an entire group of people. He doesn't care about them having different laws. Um, he doesn't care about them doing things differently. He's he's doing this purely to justify himself. Um, and the thing is. Uh, do we really think Haman would have been happy if his plan went through? I mean, it's an evil plan, but would that have would that have actually been fulfilling? And I would say, if anything, Haman teaches us that no, it doesn't. It, it, you you may have you may have heard people say, you know, well, love is blind, and and kindness and mercy are naive. Um, but I think what what Scripture shows us over and over again, and what Haman shows us in this story, is that actually violence and hatred are naive. It's, it is naive to think that, that committing violence, that hurting other people is actually going to make you happy or feel fulfilled or make any kind of difference. And in fact, love and mercy uh, are the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. So the most powerful that force that exists if God is love, it maybe works slowly and it works differently. Maybe it's more like a like a time lapse movie than it is like um, like a stroke of lightning, but um, but love is ultimately far more powerful and um, far more effective than than violence or hatred. So I think that is what Haman tells us about ourselves that that hatred is self defeating and that as um, as I believe John preached on Judas last week. Like Judas, when you develop an us-them mentality like Haman does, there's really only one place that that leads, and that's to hanging on your own gallows. You create your own, your own death, your own destruction by hating. God doesn't have to make it for you. God doesn't, God doesn't have to punish you for that. You are punishing yourself. So let's, get, let's move on, though, to the, to the thing that I think is perhaps more threatening, which is what... What does Haman uh, threaten to reveal about God to us? He wouldn't, I mean, he wouldn't be a good villain if he didn't, from a literary perspective, if he didn't reveal to us something uh, that hits us in a place that it hurts. Um, and I think that is what, what happens when God seems to be indifferent, when God seems to not be a part of the picture, when God doesn't show up or we're afraid that God isn't going to show up. Interesting point about the book of Esther. It is the only book in the Bible where God is never mentioned. You might not realize it because I think we all read it and we put God in the story as you're meant to do. 
uh, there's, there's too many things happening in a providential way not to assume that God is behind them. But no one ever mentions God, even Mordecai, when he is reasoning with Esther about how she should go into the king. He says, uh, help will come from the Jews from another place if you don't do it. He, he uses a passive voice. We don't, he doesn't even attribute, he doesn't say God will save us if you don't. And he says, perhaps you were put in this position for a time such as this. Not that God put you here. It's very interesting. It's, it's almost as if amidst all of the other deception and masking going on, God himself is, is masked. And there's something poignant about this because this is the way I think it feels as though God is in, in the world we live in today in many ways. We don't, we don't typically see big miracles like Sinai or parting the Red Sea or um, sometimes, you know, there are, there are examples where, where we do see real supernatural miracles, but oftentimes you kind of have to read God in between the lines. Um, to, to go into this a little bit more, uh, why, why I think there's something on a symbolic level going on in this story. Um, Haman, as, as we saw, is described several times in the, in the very difficult to say word in English as an agagite. Uh, okay, so what's an agagite? Um, well, we don't know entirely, but traditionally it's been linked to Agag, the king of the Amalekites. For a refresher, in case uh, you don't remember who the Amalekites are, um, <laughs> they are, as Israel is leaving Egypt, uh, so Exodus 17, they've just, they've crossed the Red Sea, they're just getting out. The Amalekites are a group that that attacks them right now. They're sort of the, the first backstabbers in the Bible in some way. Well, maybe that's Cain, I don't know. But um, they're, they're like, as a nation, they attack Israel. They see this group of former slaves escaping from Egypt and they see an opportunity there. Uh, and uh, this apparently had a big impact on Israel's collective memory because Deuteronomy says, has a command that Israel never forget what the Amalekites did to them. Uh, that's that's kind of that's kind of unique. Um, I don't think we see that with another group of people. So the Amalekites are um, symbolically the the archetypal enemy of Israel. So for Haman to be an Agagite, he's represent he's representing the Amalekites, Israel's archetypal enemy. Okay, um, so this is an indication that this story is operating at some level symbolically. Now, just as a caveat. To say that this is a symbolic story doesn't mean that it didn't happen. That's a different question. Um, Any time we read something in scripture, it has been written down in, in, in an artful, in a literary way, and it's been organized um, in order to, to convey meaning. Um, in fact, if you read really early Christian sermons and Jewish sermons, um, usually the place where they find meaning in the text is, is on a symbolic level. Like, for example, um, any of Augustine's sermons from the fourth century, you'll see him talking about Jesus, and, but describing um, calming the storm as, as the sea being, uh, being life and the boat being the church and the storm being you know, the things that life throws at us. Anyway, um, it's not that he doesn't think these things really happened. It's just that that's not where he finds meaning. And so uh, in Esther, I think it's important to look at um, not just the surface level of what actually happened, um, but to look at why is it being told in this way? So why, is, why are they highlighting? Why do they, they make us say this difficult word several times, <laughs> the agagite? Uh, why does this show up over and over again? It's because they want you to know something about Haman is that he represents something very threatening to Israel. Well, why would it be so threatening? Okay, I think you see the key to this in another, asp another part of the story that is highlighted in the passage we read, which is he decides on this heinous plan, and then what does he do to, to choose the day in which this is going to happen? He, he basically throws dice. He does it completely randomly. That's what the, um, the dice, Pur, is where the holiday, the Jewish holiday name Purim comes from. It's a really fun holiday, by the way. Um, but that's, that's another story. Anyway, um, he throws dice randomly to pick a day. 
it's as though he's saying, okay, God, uh, you're really there. If you're really a perfect being, then, then you can't intervene. Um, and if you're not, then I'm, I'm daring you to show up, basically, and do something about what I'm about to do. Now, I don't know that this is intentional on his part, but um, one, of the, one of the things that was controversial in the ancient world, and in fact, something that, um, that early Christians uh, and, and Jews interacting with Hellenism had to wrestle through is, is this idea that a perfect being, if the, if the God who created the universe is actually perfect, that means that he cannot be affected by human emotion, that we, we shouldn't be able to, um, to change God at all, which means that God really can't intervene. So if God is perfect, then God can't be involved in human affairs. Essentially, and, I mean, I think we see in our own day um, a question of, is there, is there a God there at all? Is, is everything just random? For Haman, it's not so much a question of, is there anyone out there? It's, is the person that's out there, do they really care? And, or is everything just random? Is it, do we live in sort of a deistic universe where God set the world in motion, but is, is too perfect to be concerned with it? And uh, this is where I think it becomes, it becomes scary and threatening to think about this. Um, because, of course, this doesn't happen in the Book of Esther. Uh, everything works out very well, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful answer to, to this challenge, intentional or not, that Haman gives, which is, does God actually intervene? Does God actually care? Because God does. But what if, what if the world doesn't always work that way? What if we feel more like we're in the book of Ecclesiastes, where the preacher says, one man dies rich, one man dies poor, what's, what's the difference? In the end, we all die. Where's God in all of this? Um, where, you know, injustice happens all the time, and I don't see God intervening. So, in a sense, what Haman is trying to do is unmask God. Again, I don't think it's intentional, but what his what his, um, his plan threatens to do is either reveal a God who intervenes or a God who doesn't. So what about, what happens when we don't feel like God is intervening? What, what do we do with times that don't feel like Esther, that feel more like Ecclesiastes? I want to read a a passage from a uh, Jewish theologian that I really love, one of the reasons I wanted to go to a Jewish school, actually, uh, because I think that he captures the character and the heart of God in a way that I, I rarely hear theologians able to do. Um, so this is from a book that he wrote about uh, the prophets in scripture. Uh, it's, the theologian is named Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, he's writing in mid 20th century. The divine pathos is not merely intentional, it is also transitive. The gods of mythology are self-centered, egotistic. The cowardice of Ares, the incontinence of Aphrodite, the lusts of Zeus, the jealousy of the gods are reflexive. Zeus is hit by the dart of desire and inflamed with passion for Io, with whom he desire, desires to enjoy the pleasures of Cyprus so that his eye may be eased of its desire. Pathos, on the other hand, is not a self-centered and self-contained state. It is always, in prophetic thinking, directed outward. It always expresses a relation to man. It is therefore not one of God's attributes as such. It has a transitive rather than a reflexive character, not separated from history. The theology of pathos brings about a shift in the understanding of man's ultimate problems. The prophet does not see the human situation in and by itself. The predicament of man is a predicament of God who has a stake in the human situation. Sin, guilt, suffering cannot be separated from the divine situation. The life of sin is more than a failure of man. It is a frustration to God. Thus, man's alienation from God is not the ultimate fact by which to measure man's situation. The divine pathos, the fact of God's participation in the predicament of man, is the elemental fact. 
The biblical writers were aware of the paradox involved in God's relation to man. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love upon your fathers and chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as at this day, which is Deuteronomy 10, 14 through 15. Never in history has man been taken as seriously as in prophetic thinking. Man is not only an image of God, he is a prophet perpetual concern of God. The idea of pathos adds a new dimension to human existence. Wherever, whatever man does affects not only his own life, but also the life of God insofar as it is directed to man. The import of man raises him beyond the level of a mere creature. He is a consort, a partner, a factor in the life of God. I think I read this and I think what a beautiful picture of, of our God. That what Heschel gets at, I think, is, is almost, you might say, Esther from God's perspective. I think Esther as a book is, is unique in that it, it doesn't give us a window, unlike every other biblical book, into what's going on on the divine side of things. We don't get an insight into God's God's actions or God's emotions or what, what causes God to do things like many of the other biblical books give us. We have a totally human perspective. In many ways, it's throwing us into the world as we experience it without that extra help, that extra window that scripture usually gives us. But what Heschel suggests is that if we were to look at Esther and the events of Esther from God's perspective, that God's heart breaks, not just for the Jewish people, but also for Haman, as all of this is happening, that God is perfect, but because God is, is beyond infinite and beyond and transcends, even transcendence, that God can choose to be involved with us, and God does choose that, even though being involved with us means that it hurts him dearly. And what, what better way of understanding Jesus that God is so intimately involved, so intimately cares about us, that he became human himself and allowed us to kill him and forgave us for that. And not only forgave us, but raised us up to be, as Heschel puts it, a consort, a partner, and a factor in the life of God himself. To me, this is the only answer to the question, what, is it, what does it mean when it seems like God isn't intervening, because the fact is, whether or not we see God's intervention, God is always with us. God is always suffering with us when we suffer and rejoicing when we rejoice, and that there is nothing that we go through that God wasn't willing to suffer himself, even death, even torture, even being lonely and forsaken. And so, I invite us as as we think about as we think about Esther to think to realize that ultimately the the opposite of of Haman's way is isn't just love it it is the self-giving and self-sacrificing love of God that we see not just in his his we see slantwise in his intervention in his in his engagement with humans throughout scripture, and we see very profoundly and directly in the love of Jesus and his death and resurrection. And so, um, as I close in prayer, I, I invite you to think this week and, and throughout, um, throughout your days about the ways in which you see God uh, with us and the ways in which you feel like God is absent, and just to remember that that God is love and that that love is, is always with us. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this time that we can be together today and um, for the love, for the great love you have for us and for your willingness to enter into our lives and our pain and our suffering and also our joy and to invite us into your own life, to live with you and to be a part of you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Rachel.
Let's take a moment and open our hymnals and stand while we sing Who is on the Lord's Side? First Congregational Church, hear your blessing from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have laid for you, declares the Lord, plan to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Amen. <laughs> 